So hello everybody. I mean, uh, I mean, for the first time I'll be open in a session. <laughs> this is completely new for me. I mean, Guido Cervoni had some problems connecting, so we'll be hosting this session in the very early moments. I mean, in fact, I mean, I hope Guido will join us later. I mean, I, I mean. Uh, Marco, I mean, is, is a friend and uh, who you included in his own presentation, more information about his background, the work he's doing. So I uh, hopefully I will have to introduce Marco. I mean, most of the people that I'm seeing here that is participate or know have been working on some projects with Marco. So without any further ado, Marco, please introduce yourself, introduce your work and start your presentation. I, I will be able for Guido to join us later. Otherwise, I mean, I will moderate the questions. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Jose. Uh, thanks, everybody. And sorry for my voice. It's like eight o'clock here in New York. So I'm very happy to uh, get this invitation. Thanks, Jose. Thanks for everybody who joined. Uh, as Jose mentioned, the part of my presentation also involves um, uh, my background because I wanted to show you how I came to study uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, Jose, I, can you confirm everything is okay? Yes, everything okay. is okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm currently a Lamar Research Professor at Columbia University. Uh, I'm also a NASA adjunct scientist uh, at the GIST, the Goddard Institute of Space Studies here in New York City. And I'm also a Philip professor at the Institute of Economics of the Santana School of Advanced Studies in Pisa, Italy. So um, my, uh, the outline that uh, I want to talk to you about a little bit of an overview. Uh, and uh, this outline is really very classical. I mean, we're going to go through uh, some general introduction impacts of climate and economic sectors, flood and sea level rise, uh, some general considerations, examples of the work I did, and some issues or recommendations. And uh, let me start with, uh, uh, with my journey. The reason why I wanted to put this, it's not just because I'm so egocentric and I to speak about myself all the time, but mostly because uh, I receive a lot of questions from especially young people, how do you end up doing the things you do? Uh, and how do you end up studying the things you're studying? So I wanted to brief, uh, provide a brief overview. At the same time, I also don't consider myself a pure risk or flawed analyst uh, because my background is very different. And I wanted to share with you where I come from, what is the journey, uh, because I, uh, I basically, this is the way I approach my work in a, in, a, in a way that is more like system science oriented. So I took my degree in electrical engineering in 99. I took my PhD in physics in electromagnetic waves and started to study snow in 2002. Then I moved to NASA for uh, developing remote sensing algorithms for snow. Uh, this was between 2003 and 2008. Then I uh, started to develop in the same period something to study melting over the Greenland ice sheet from satellites. It was about 15 years ago, 13 years ago. Then I became professor at City College where I decided to study more about Greenland. I became a, a fieldwork expert. Since then, I've led about 12 expeditions to Greenland and two expeditions to Antarctica. Uh, I've been looking more and more into uh, melting of, uh, of Greenland and Antarctica, the relative contribution to sea level rise. Then I went to NSF uh, and I became program manager temporarily uh, in the Polar Cyber Infrastructure Program, where I had the chance to have a, a much broader even view of things. Uh, and then I joined Columbia and NASA and uh, starting about 2015, I became more interested in merging my expertise uh, concerning the sea level rise, the, um, concerning the uh, uh, melting of Greenland and Antarctica to practical applications. And it led me to collaborate with the Columbia Business School with other um, institute and economics uh, uh, colleagues in economies. And I started then basically the journey that uh, you see here. So where are we are now? Let me step back. Let me start being uh, with, the, uh, with my general uh, overview background of climate. So this is a simulation that many of you clearly know showing the surface temperature anomalies uh, over uh, globally, uh, starting in mid uh, around 1870 uh, to today, 
uh, simulated by the NASA GIS model. And of course, when you see red, it's the warmer, where you see cold, uh, blue is the colder. But of course, you start seeing the starting from the 90s, a lot of the red is appearing. And of course, a lot of the warming is also occurring in the Arctic, where Greenland um, is uh, located and is, uh, of course, a large contributor, contributor to sea level rise. Uh, let's talk for a second about impacts and likely, likelihood of events. Of course, uh, we want to connect for practical purposes what we study in Greenland with societal application. This is also one of the reasons that I decided to move more toward the uh, field of uh, uh, economics and, uh, and societal implications. This is a map that is produced by the World Economic Forum uh, as part of the Global Risk Report in 2020. And it shows on the x-axis the likelihood of an event versus the yeah. potential impact. Sorry, Marco, we can't see the, the, the slides moving. Sorry about that. You cannot see it? No, no, it stopped on 1890. <laughs> we need another 110, 130 years now. <laughs> okay, can, can you see it? No, no. Because I moved it. Hold on, let me... Um... Now you can see me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I can see. Okay, you. let me see. Let me share the screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, no, not yet. But I see that the saying has started the screen sharing. But I can't can you see, see your. No, no, I can't see your screen. No. Okay. Uh, no. Can you see? No, I mean. No, we can't. Let Sorry. me reconnect for a second. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'm. Um, well, sorry about this interruption. I mean, uh, I mean, we'll be back soon. I mean, sometimes these things happens with technology. Just a second, please. Okay, let me. Yeah. Let me, let me see if you can see now, Jose. Can you see? It? Oh yes, yes. Now I can see your presentation. Okay, let me. I'm switching slide. Let me know. Can you see the new slide? Uh, no, this is the. Yes, yes. We can. Good. Thank you. Let's move. Okay. On. Let me know if I uh, switch to the next slides, and I apologize for that. I don't know what's happening. Um, so the World Economic Forum has has shown that when you look at the map, one thing that is important is to look at. And I hope you can see in my mouse where I'm pointing at is the climate action failure and extreme weather together of course with biodiversity loss and natural disasters are at the top of the scale both in terms of likelihood of occurrence on the x-axis and of course of impacts so this is really becoming a huge implication for the economy extreme weather and of course the lack of climate action failure um, can you see the next slide jose yes yes we can okay. Uh, so let's take for a second a quick step back because, of course, the economics is important. But one of the things that I like to do, and one of my expertise allows me to do, is of course to look at the processes, the physical processes, the climate processes driving the exposure of of the uh, of the properties and the economic assets. So one thing that I want people and I like people to remember, especially those who are not familiar with the processes of sea level rise, is that the ocean is not a bathtub. The ocean doesn't rise the same way in, in different places. I know that we've been used to think about there is a three millimeter uh, sea level rise globally uh, over the entire, uh, the entire world, uh, but really because of the different processes, the uh, ocean is rising at different rates in different places. The map you see here, it shows uh, the rate uh, of sea level rise uh, for uh, the trends for different locations as measured by tide, by tide gauges and buoy data along the coast. So you see there will be uh, the magnitude and the color tells you that you know, there are differences. Of course, most of the places is going up. There are some places that are going down. That's not because the ocean is not rising, but because the land is rising faster than the ocean for uh, you know, geophysical reasons. And of course, uh, one of the things that we need to remember also is that where does the heat go? Where is the heat that we produce on our planet going? Well, 93%, 94% of the heat goes to the ocean. 2% uh, goes into the atmosphere. 
and about 2% goes against, uh, again into uh, the ice sheet, uh, sea ice, and, and so on. So uh, why is this important? Because when you look also at the map of, uh, uh, as I was mentioning you, the sea, uh, the sea level, the ocean is not a bathtub. Uh, this is a map derived from satellites and it shows 22 years of sea level rise anomaly uh, as measured uh, from, again, uh, an altimeter. And where you see red means that the ocean is rising, the, the sea is rising faster. And one thing that, of course, you can see is that where you expect to have warmer oceans, you will have a stronger rise uh, in, in the sea level. And why is that? Well, mostly because uh, uh, the ocean has uh, old fluids, when it warms up, it tends to expand. Uh, think about the, uh, the air balloon, uh, where you just warm up the air inside, the air expands, it allows the balloon to raise. The same is going to happen with the ocean. And so the more we warm up the ocean, which again, it absorbs 90% of the heat at least, uh, the more we, uh, uh, the ocean expands. So why is, and of course, this drives also the different uh, ways in which the ocean rises in different locations. Um, so you will see, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico, you have warmer temperatures of waters. You, know, you have a much stronger uh, swallowing of the of the ocean, and so so to say. And the ocean is, uh, and the sea level rise is not just increasing; is also accelerating. Uh, the same paper that was showing us the map of the distribution of sea level rise at global level is also telling us that there is an acceleration of sea level rise. So it's just not increasing at the same rate every year but every year is going faster and faster. And uh, missing the acceleration, which actually looks very small, feels like a 0.084 millimeter per square year. But actually, if you do a linear fit, uh, instead of doing a quadratic curve, if you project things by 2100, you will miss half of, uh, of the signal, basically due to the acceleration. So this factor on the long term is extremely important. What is driving the acceleration? So we know that the ocean is warming up. The warming rate actually is going at the same rate uh, year after year. But what's really driving is the uh, relative contribution of the ice sheets, uh, Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, it is uh, pretty well established, and we are pretty confident that a lot of the uh, acceleration of the um, sea level rise that we observed uh, and we're observing is related to the acceleration of the contribution of Greenland and Antarctica to sea level rise. Uh, this map, this plot, shows you the relative contribution of the different major factors to sea level rise. Uh, on the left, you see that currently thermal expansion is accounted for about half of the total contribution, Greenland, uh, glaciers, and Antarctica for mostly the rest. But what you see in the future by 2100, uh, using a business as usual, which basically correspond to what we call uh, the RCP 8.5 uh, scenario for emissions, we'll see that a relative role of thermal expansion is reduced. Uh, so is the role of glaciers and Antarctic and Greenland will play a larger role. This does not mean that the thermal expansion is slowing down. It means that simply that the relative contribution of this factor is gonna be much smaller and, and this factor as well. And mostly because there will be few glaciers left by the end of the century that can contribute to the sea level rise. And the relative contribution of Greenland and Antarctica, which is you know, the big elephant in the room, uh, will be increasing so fast that it will overcome the effect of the thermal expansion. What do you expect in the future? And uh, of course, knowing the past and knowing what to expect is fundamental to do economic projections, to understand, you know, to help policymakers to build and plan for resiliency, mitigation strategies, uh, alert population, and so on. So this is the record we have so far. Again, we have the proxy record uh, from, you know, observations or uh, anecdotal information, tight gauge data. This is the satellite data record that is continuing, and these are future projections. But really, this is a big range of things. And how do we know really what to expect in the future? Uh, well, we can learn from the Book of Earth. Uh, we can learn from the past uh, in the sense that 
uh, we, thanks to Paleo Climate, uh, and we, we, well, colleagues, can, uh, can study and can uh, let us know what happened or what we think it happened in the past when the um, conditions of uh, CO2 or temperature were similar to today. So what you see here on the left, this is where we are, present days. On the right, you have a sea level in meters, which is basically showing you the blue line. The CO2 values in, in part per million is on the left axis and it's these green dots. And of course, these are the temperatures. So you see that in the past, <clears throat> we had similar circumstances where the temperature was similar to today, the CO2 level was lower than, than now, because now we are above 400 parts per million. Uh, and of course, these slides should be adapted, uh, but it still holds. Uh, and then uh, you have in the past that when temperature for different reasons, in this case, we have orbital changes, volcanic eruptions, uh, the level of the ocean, the sea was much higher than today, um, six meters, you know, 15, 20 feet uh, up to who knows a lot. Uh, and the, the one thing that we need to account for is that the, um, the way this happened in the past uh, was occurring in like tens, of, in thousands of years. And uh, the forcing, so basically what drives these changes occurred very slowly. So the earth had time to adapt and adjust and modify and the oceans were, were rising. For example, it, people think that in the past, uh, Antarctica was actually melting sooner than Greenland and the potential change in the ocean circulation that Antarctica created was uh, uh, affecting the melting of Greenland. And so actually what happened instead this time because of the anthropogenic forcing that uh, pumped so much CO2 in a hundred years, there was uh, they had the same effects for tens of thousands of years in the past. Greenland is waking up as woke up first. Antarctica is now waking up. So many people think that what we're seeing now is actually only a small portion of what to expect, both based on the evidence that we have from the paleoclimatology studies in the past and from the fact that things are occurring this time very quickly uh, rather than slowly. Now imagine the way I like to see these things, imagine that the earth is your host, is your guest. And uh, in the past, you're basically trying to let the person know, okay, thank you for being in my house. I want you to leave now. And you take the person very slowly out. The person will react in a, in a relatively slow way. And this is what happened in the past. Rather than pushing your guest completely out of the door, the reaction of the system will be very different. And this is what we're doing. We're giving a big push now to the system where in the past there was a gentle uh, so a gentle forcing in one direction or the other. But of course, this is not only the sea level rise is not only the mid is not only the only uh, driver. Uh, it is the, really the combination uh, that of coastal erosion, extreme rain events, high tides, stronger and more frequent storms, hurricanes that is creating the perfect recipe for uh, uh, alerting us now to take action now. And uh, yes, we look at sea level rise projections on time scales of hundreds of years because of the relatively, uh, of the time scale of the processes. But if you start combining all the factors that we know are happening, uh, then this kind of uh, uh, effects are on the time scale of financial and economic uh, factors. Uh, for example, um, we're talking about five to 10 years for, uh, for some of the uh, portfolio managers. We're talking about 20 to 30 years for mortgage management. We're talking about 10, 20, 30 years for agricultural management, health issues, population rise, and so on. So we are not looking only at 100 years, but of course, the combination of these factors is affecting us now. Uh, how much, how to expect, and what's going on already? Uh, there is this study that came out by Xiang uh, in 2017, uh, was projecting for the United States uh, about $600 billion loss by 2100. Uh, the areas, of course, that you see are the ones uh, exposed in the, along the coast a lot, but also, of course, in the Midwest, where a lot of rain or snow events or other events can occur. Now, how uh, 
likely this is to happen? Well, if you look at 2017, there were $300 billion in loss all in the United States. So it's held, uh, it's 0.6% of the GDP uh, of the United States and it's held of what estimated by 2100. Now, of course, this was a lot of due to uh, a lot of hurricanes, Toronto, but you can see that uh, it's strongly connected uh, to water flows. Uh, and of course, you can think about it. You can say this is very, it's one case. It doesn't make, uh, it doesn't support the paper or results, nor I try to make the case, uh, you know, necessarily. Uh, still, uh, if you look at 2020 now, uh, 2020 tied with 2017 and 2011. So even the, in the 2020, we had uh, events that exceeded uh, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in terms of damage. Uh, and uh, disasters, I'm sorry. And also, of course, they're strongly connected to uh, extreme weather, uh, hurricanes and, and floods. Um, the other thing also that in this context we need to consider is that floods, uh, as we not just necessarily, again, sea level rise, but floods in general, uh, they've been uh, in the number of events uh, that are exceeding $1 billion have been increasing over the past decade with respect to the decade before. This data uh, from NOAA shows you on the left, the uh, again, the $1 billion event or above uh, mapped through um, 20 to 2010. And uh, the one on the right shows you the ones that occurred between 2010 and, 2010, uh, and 2020. And you do see that there's been, of course, a huge increase in both the distribution and the number of events together with the cost of these events. And of course, this is strongly connected to the hurricane seasons, storm surges, sea level rise, and so on. This is not true only in the United States. Uh, it's true everywhere. If you look at Munich, uh, insurance companies, especially reinsurance companies, have been paying a, a lot of attention over the past uh, few years uh, to this issue because, of course, they are uh, strongly impacted by the insurance market because they have to price uh, how much to charge the insurance companies. And they have been spending a lot of time understanding the, the, uh, the losses. And if you look at uh, uh, the, what they call relevant natural catastrophe, it, this is happening all over. And you look at the blue dots. It's sorry, sorry, Mark, to interrupt you again. We are still stopping on the... I mean, on the image of coastal erosion, extreme events, rain, high tides. Wow, sorry, I made, a, I went through four slides already. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to try to share again. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that again. No, I don't know what's going on. Can you see now? Oh, it happened the same thing. You can see that you're starting screen sharing, but uh, actually we can see the slides. Okay, I'll, I'll, I don't know what to do. I'll log in again. Yeah, okay, okay. We'll wait. So again, <laughs> bear with me. We'll be back soon, okay? And I apologize, everybody. This is the first time really happened, of course, it, when it's not supposed to be. Do you yeah. see it? Yeah, so so you could, if you could just show the map, for example, start, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. So yeah. This is the map of the uh, United States. So I was telling yeah. you that there are $300 billion in 2017. And this is the map I was referring to. Um, and uh, the 2020 also tied with 2017 and 2011. Next slide. I'm going to say next slide so that you know that I'm moving to the next in case it stops. Yeah. Uh, and now, so I was showing the flooding is occurring in socioeconomic chat because uh, you see, I'm going to try to keep it in this version. So maybe it yeah. doesn't get. Yeah, maybe better. Uh, maybe better. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so you will see that on the right, the 2010 to 2020 billion dollar flooding has been increasing both in terms of distribution uh, and, uh, and, and amount. And this is true also, of course, a global scale, where you see what I was talking about. You see the blue dots here. They are all referring to, um, uh, to hydrological-based disasters. And, uh, um, 
and it's uh, uh, it's basically showing you how pervasive is the effect of floods uh, also and especially in developing countries. Uh, I'm going to the next slide. Uh, I'm showing you now what could be the we are still we are still in the same slide now. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry the number the number of events. If you just uh, I mean, it's like 24, it's not moving. I'm on slide 26 now. No, and we're still watching uh, slide 24. Yeah. What about now? No, no, still blocked on slide 24. Okay, I appreciate somebody said these things happen. Thanks for first. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Let me yeah. try it again. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have I've been receiving a flood, a flood of the information here. So just again, wait for a few more minutes, please. Okay. okay let's see if this works. Um, can you see it? Uh, no, actually, no. There are so many screens now open. Yes, yes, now we can, yeah. Okay, sorry. So I'm going to skip a few slides because I want to go to one of the points that I wanted to discuss with, this, with the people. I wanted to basically mention that the effect of flood is already here. Uh, I changed on slide 26. Um, and uh, can you see it? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so... This shows you also a package of real estate investment trust of a, of a Japanese portfolio. And it shows that all the uh, houses and properties in this portfolio are exposed to typhoon risks. Uh, one thing that I wanted to discuss, I'm going to slide 28 and I went switch to a list now, Jose. Um, can you confirm it? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry. So then I, when I will tell you I'm switching and if I don't hear anything, then you see it's okay. If I hear from you, then we have an issue. Yes, okay. Uh, so the one thing that I wanted to discuss also, it, it's very important that, especially with Networking Fridays, and I hope this will be only the seed of, uh, you know, conversations, collaborations, and, uh, and who knows what, um, that there are some issues that I identified that while I was working, you know, first of all, we have a lack of consistent metrics and spread of tools. There is a lot of tools around now that have been developed commercially that we don't know how reliable they are. And of course, there's a lack of consistent metrics. I think we need to focus a lot uh, on developing this. What is the role of man build infrastructure on the exposure? If something happened 20 years ago, what would be the exposure, the cost, uh, the, the risk uh, based on what and where it has been built? Uh, what satellite data is great, but what has been the temporal coverage? Can we really benefit from the use? And, and there's a lot of socioeconomic vulnerability uh, uh, with climate impacts that we uh, have to capture because ultimately there will be a lot of exposed people who pay the highest prices. So I wanna, after giving you this brief introduction, I wanted to switch to three test cases that I would like to discuss with you. Hopefully this will open for conversations in the future again or networking, or just to steer some ideas. Uh, I'm sliding, I'm on slide 30 now. I'm showing the uh, the first test case. Yes. Uh, and this is like Hurricane Florence. So Hurricane Florence, I'm showing the map of, uh, of Hurricane Florence, is uh, uh, it happened in 2018. And one of the questions that, that I asked was, OK, what is the effect? What would have been the effect of Hurricane Florence should have occurred years ago? Uh, when there was less buildings along the coast and so on. So what you see here on the right uh, is the distribution of the bullseye of the, of the storm when it landed with the property distribution. These are all single dot and all the homes in North and South Carolinas. And so this was the question. If we overlay and we, dis we generate and maps of floods based on satellite, gauge data and uh, FEMA uh, information. And we overlap these two data sets, the flooded and the, and the real estate property distribution. And ask the question, what, how much of these houses were exposed? What was the value of houses that were exposed? And I'm starting now to, I'm going to the next slide. 
and I'm showing this is basically on the bottom line on the plot, you see this blue area is the value in billions of dollars exposed. So this was about $5 billion. And you see on the top the distribution of the properties and very small between 1800 and 1900. I'm going now to 1900, 1950. Please let me know if you don't see it. The number of houses has been increasing. The exposed value was relatively still small now we're going to uh, now we're going to uh, 1950 to 200, uh, 2000. Uh, of course, World War II, uh, the economic boom. There is a, a lot of the uh, properties they are built. Uh, the value exposed goes up. Uh, now, what happened between 20, 2000 and 2018? The total value of exposed property was about 54 billion dollars. Uh, and now I have a, a map showing all the four uh, dates, the four periods with the final map. Uh, let me know if you cannot see it. What this is showing you is that the exposed value uh, should uh, Hurricane Florence have occurred in the past was increasing because, of course, of the new homes that were built. And it, ran, it went up starting a lot in the 80s when the economic boom uh, started, but also one interesting thing that I'm not showing here is that, and you can really see it from the area here, but the major point is that despite the number of properties built between 2000 and 2018, and you can see here from this map was smaller than the, the properties built in the past, the, because they were built in proximity of water bodies, this increased the exposure. And so even if there was a, a strong reduction in the number of properties that were built, also because of the 2008 house crisis, the exposure, the exposed value of these properties or the exposure increased because they were mostly built along the coast for speculative purposes. What does it mean? It means that when we look at attributions of exposure or damage or cost, uh, this can become an extremely important tool to untangle what is really due uh, uh, to um, what exposure is due or the damage to uh, the new infrastructure and evolution of the urban infrastructure versus the physical exposure. A second point that I want to, second test case studies that I want to show you also, uh, and I'm now showing the slide uh, with the title for the second test case, Jose. Yes, we are with you. Is, uh, is uh, the test is basically the coverage. Uh, of uh, satellites. You know, we know, and I've been working with satellites for, uh, I'm switching to the slide that is a summary here. Um, we've been, wor I've been working with satellites for a very long time. And uh, uh, one thing that, um, of course, is they are great, especially recently, there's been a huge increase in, uh, in the, the possibility of using them for a lot of applications. But one bigger problem is really that we are limited still by when they look at, when they pass, where they can collect information, the presence of clouds. Uh, and, uh, and so we cannot really collect daily information. We can use them only when they are available. So one thing that we did, we looked at passive microwave data, which is something I've been working for uh, my entire career. And uh, uh, with passive microwave, because they are not sensitive to clouds, they can see through things, they can, uh, and they, they have a large, coverage of the planet, you can really see that, uh, you can really see that uh, uh, it's possible to use them, even though they have not been uh, used so far for mo daily monitoring of flood at global scale. Um, I'm looking at this case, for example, I'm taking an example in Sudan. This is especially important for uh, those countries where there is no uh, in situ infrastructure to help them to develop service and alerts. And you see this map is showing you the, you know, the Khartoum area within, within Sudan. And historically, passive microwave, they've not been used because they're very coarse. So this is, is what you will see if you were looking at Sudan uh, of this area with respect to the current state of the art of passive microwave. But we developed a tool that allows us to increase the resolution. We can actually look at better maps and we can use this information that now we can extract a daily basis at every place in the world to start estimating the presence or absence of flood. Uh, and <clears throat> for example, uh, 
I want to show you two cases. Again, Sudan, there was a flood of August 2019. Uh, in Khartoum, there were about 60 people died, uh, and there was 190,000 people in 15 different areas affected. We applied a passive microwave, and what you basically see here is the red line is where it shows you that there is a flood occurring, and this is time series of the passive microwave showing you that the blue area is where the flood occurred on the day. And the tool is able to, of course, detect this. But if you use optical data, then um, you will not be able to see it because there were cloudy skies and everything was covered. Uh, uh, Marco, Marco, can you click uh, over the uh, slide 42? We can't see we, we are stuck in 41. Can yeah, I did that. I think we're stuck again. Oh, uh, well, yeah. One second. Yeah. Okay, sorry. It is really the first time it happens. I feel like a PhD student failing his exam. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry about that. Everybody's connected. Can um, you see the Bangladesh flood now? Yes, a Bangladesh flood, yes. So I was mentioning about clouds. No, another example is the 2005 Bangladesh flood. This is the image that you would get from optical data. There's clouds. You cannot see what's happening too much. But when you start looking at passing microwave, we can actually, for the same day, retrieve the extent of inundated area and provide maps uh, when necessary. So just to summarize, Yes, satellites are great, but what we developed was this tool to uh, use this passive macro data to increase the coverage or the resolution uh, of, uh, of, the, of these data sets for operational services and application, which is fundamental in this regard. One last topic that I wanna also to talk to you, and, uh, and I'm now showing the test case number three, Jose, uh, a link in socioeconomic vulnerability. Can you see it? Yes, we are with you. One aspect also that I've been caring a lot recently uh, is, and I have five more minutes left. I'm sorry, uh, I will have to take five more minutes because of all the technical issues. No, 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 don't worry about that. We have plenty of time, yeah. Is the climate gentrification. So climate gentrification, so we're moving from uh, uh, operational satellite applications to uh, real estate and financial impacts to social vulnerability. And these are so all aspects that I really do care about. And this last one is, is a particularly dear to me uh, because of the human uh, of the human component. So what people have been suggesting is that uh, I'm going to show you now the case of Little River, Little Haiti in Florida. Can you see, Jose? Yes. Yes. Okay. We can. So what happened is that uh, places that like Little Haiti, which is located in this part here of Miami. Uh, they were historically not interested, interesting for uh, uh, real estate speculators because they were inland. They were not prime time. Uh, they were historically, historically populated by socially vulnerable people, low income, um, uh, um, high, uh, you know, um, uh, poor, you know, low income, uh, high poverty level, and so on, low education. And so, what's happening? What many people are suggesting is that. Uh, through a mechanism that promotes an increase in real in rental, uh, increased number of evictions uh, in these areas that are now weather shelter, climate safe, so to say, uh, speculators are starting to, well, there's a theory that speculators are starting to um, push people out uh, through this uncontrolled increase in uh, rent and evictions. And I have two uh, extracts from two newspapers here. And so what I did, uh, I created this, and I'm switching now to the tool, a climate gentrification flood tool that allows us to quantify and properly address uh, from, a, a, from a, a robust point of view, if this is actually the case, to, to generate a tool that can be used by local communities, policymakers. And uh, I want to show you some results about what I was showing you. So uh, I, I mentioned Little River and Little Haiti. So this is what the tool tells me, that if I, I input what I call the climate gentrification uh, score, this is exactly the area that the tool suggests this could happen in. And I'm showing a slide called GC score, Jose. Now, how 
good is this tool? How can we identify this tool? What's really uh, sorry, S sorry, Mark, we stuck again with this with this table. We're not seeing the GC score. Okay. Again, just one minute, please. First time it happened. We have to learn, understand what okay. happened. Sorry, I'm glad. I, I really appreciate there are still 66 participants. Thank you for your patience. I'm <laughs> very, I'm embarrassed. And uh, I, I guess it's never too late to learn uh, how people feel. I will be more passionate and compassionate with my students. Um, so let me, let me go straight to the point. Um, this tool allows us to look at things and identify places where gentrification is, a, is occurring. How do we know that? Now look at this. This is where the eviction, this is where the area where the tool suggests the climate gentrification is occurring. This is the plot time series of number of eviction for that area. And this is the number of eviction for the area right above where gentrification is not occurring you do see these huge peaks of eviction starting in 2014 and lasting through 2016, which is when we think eviction start, uh, the gentrification started. Now, what does it mean? I'm moving to the next, uh, to the next uh, uh, slide where it says the house sale market. Yes. Look at also this, if you look at the average sale price, which is what I show you on the y-axis as a function of time for two different areas, the top one is the area where it is gentrifying, the bottom one is not gentrifying. You see that the value of the house starting at about $60,000 uh, uh, mid 90s. And of course, this is the 2008 crisis. Uh, but then starting in 2014, the prices go skyrocketing over here. And it's not the same much faster than the area where there's no gentrifying is heavily populated by white people above the poverty level. This area, little 80, is 85% populated by, uh, by people who belong to minorities. Uh, there's been a huge uh, decrease in the poverty level because a lot of people have been, again, moving out. And so what, what you can see here is really that this area, the tool that I developed, uh, it can really identify areas that are potentially subject to gentrification. And this can be applied to other stressors, uh, for example, wildfires or to other regions. I'm currently looking at Florida, but of course there will be more uh, areas where uh, others could be interested. And uh, I'm more than happy to share uh, these tools and the data with uh, everyone. I'm going to the final thought slide uh, and I'm sweating cold because <laughs> this has been an interesting journey. Uh, my my me me message here is uh, floods are currently there, impacting many sectors already. Um, of course, I could not bring, uh, I have prepared like 200 slides to summarize them to these 30. Uh, I'm more than happy to follow up with any of you who's interested in, in, uh, in discussion. But of course, one point I want to make is remote sensing technology. They can provide data at daily or sub-daily uh, resolution. And with the passive map data we developed, we can actually provide this uh, maps of uh, potential inundation uh, at global scale or in specific areas on a daily basis. Uh, properly quantify the role of urbanization and exposure is key uh, because we need to understand the attributions of the exposure damage and separate between the man-made infrastructure versus the physical uh, infrastructure. Socially vulnerable people are already impacted by floods. There are many direct impacts, of course, the cost of insurance and everything else, but there are these indirect mechanisms through which uh, they have been already uh, penalized and developing these tools that can help advocacy groups or, or uh, local communities or other colleagues to make the case to support these communities is extremely important. And uh, this is what I was going to show you. And one last point is, interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary collaborations are crucial. Uh, we need to converge um, toward this, uh, the implementation of solutions. And it's extremely important that we now start consolidating a solid base for these collaborations in the future. And uh, I'm actually now working with some colleagues in California with the National Science Foundation 
to identify stakeholders for a large workshop to start building in a community way these, these activities. And uh, please feel free to contact me if you're interested in. Uh, and this is my thank you slide. I hope you're gonna see it. And thank you for being patient. My apologies, I have no idea what happened. Thank you, Marco. Thank you a lot for for your presentation. You know, things happen. Don't, don't worry about that. We have a lot of people over here. We have some questions. Why you wait for some questions? I mean, there's a lot of things to unpack on your presentation. Thank you so much. But um, I mean, um, one of my comments, I mean, is related to a question of, I mean, Gregory Jenkins, these kind of tools that you are providing, I mean, it somehow could be used and to increase, I mean, inequality in, in terms of, I mean, uh, if this kind of tools people could predict in the future. I mean, where will be the safest area? It could remove, I mean, through gentrification, these tools. How can you, how this kind of information could be provided to, to the people really, uh, uh, how to say, directly affected on floods from minorities, for example? Yeah, Jose, thanks for the question. So, uh, Greg, uh, thanks for the question. I, I was reading about it. Um, so, first of all, I don't think we can control human nature. Uh, I mean, the best you can do is provide the best information and then how you translate that into knowledge and how you apply the knowledge, unfortunately, it's something that goes into ethics. But I think that that's why I was referring to uh, advocacy groups. Now there is a rumor that all this gentrification is happening, but I wanted to develop a tool that, uh, I wanted to develop a tool that is, uh, um, affordable, all the data sets are publicly available, the one I use. Uh, and I want to develop a final GIS tool that people can log in and, and perform their analysis for their own community so they can have data at hand uh, to, to talk to their communities and so on. Um, so in this case, this is for the gentrification. For the, the question that Greg was asking is that, what about the prediction of the floods? Well, the passive microwave data goes back to 1979 it allows us to build a statistical probability for every pixel to be inundated. And we can use this information in conjunction with, uh, with flood models to understand where, what is the uncertainty of all flood models. We could force uh, the prediction models with a few days before the event to constrain the, uh, the prediction and help to better uh, have estimates of uh, the future of the future losses, uh, and I agree, especially in Africa, this is a very important point, especially when, you know, there is one body, water body that is one country and is another country has been affected by that water body, monitoring the other country in this way and try to have a best information to feed your model in your own country is extremely important. So this can definitely be used for that purpose. Yeah, thank you. I mean, going back to the question of Gregory, I mean, uh, the question, I didn't say the question for, for the audience is the, the passive microwave and floods is an awesome tool for the emergency managers to act. But what about the predictions of the floods, especially in Africa? So it always already replied. Uh, yeah, by that was, I'm sorry, Jose. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm um, going back to the questions. I mean, we have a question from Omak Parak. Uh, what role do insurance companies play in amplifying risk should many of the zones after damage not to be rendered as unsurable uh, that's a very interesting question if this happens adaptation and retreat you'll be improved I, I totally agree I, I think insurance companies uh, are when it comes to flood they are starting to uh, especially in the United States becoming more and more um, uh, present uh, they still have a, a small part of the market mostly because uh, the, uh, the business model that insurance companies use for, uh, for their uh, estimates, it does not feel, fit very well with the kind of prediction we can do for floods. Uh, I mean, how do you price uh, one home uh, that is on New Jersey shore and another one is five miles away uh, if you cannot really properly model or understand where if one home versus the other is gonna be impacted? I think a, a large role uh, is gonna be played by the reinsurance companies because they are the one that sets the prices for the insurance companies uh, for these kind of things. And then this will channel down 
uh, to, you know, of course, to the single uh, payers. Uh, one important aspect also is, of course, the fact that so far and as of now, there is no incentive for any private company to jump into the market from the government uh, in, in anything. So uh, my, my feeling is that uh, this uh, big, uh, the big insurance companies are, are exploring the market. There is a, a, a huge, um, uh, there is a huge uh, field of research, which is parametric insurance, which is basically try to get the data automatically to a computer that calculates the, uh, the, the risk and then it creates uh, uh, basically a payment for somebody. It's all automated. It's very effective, I understand, for earthquakes, but uh, there are a few cases that are starting to be analyzed for flood, but, uh, and this could be one direction to go. I don't know if there will be ever a place where it will be uninsurable because one thing that we need to remember, we're considering and thinking in terms of 10, 20 years without accounting for the dynamic aspect of the society. Uh, maybe again, there will be areas as I was showing that will be more developed inland. Uh, and we're talking about the next 20, 30 years because a lot of people are by young people, new generations of people who made money during the 30s and the 40s now, uh, they are climate aware they don't want to buy along the coast because they're afraid, but also they don't want to give the money to what well, they're speculators in the past. And so now they're moving inland, but how is this then shifted the market? There will be, of course, consequences. And I think we're talking about now insurance slash economic models, which like the impact assessment models, they do not account yet for the dynamic nature of the, of the societal uh, aspect. And, uh, and so it's kind of difficult to see uh, if there will be properties that be uninsurable and how they will, will happen. For sure, transparency of information, as I was mentioning, the public data available, uh, the government stepping in and trying to help understanding the sources and the consequences of this is crucial to improve adaptation because, and provide data information to the local communities. Because as a colleague, Louise Comfort from uh, yesterday from University of Pittsburgh, I think she's a risk management expert. I was on the phone with her. She suggests it's a, it's a feedback loop. You know, you we change one thing, the society will change, the, uh, the physics will change, and so on. So it's really something that involves the local communities, and we need to provide a tool to them. Okay, thank you, Marco. We move on with Milton Campbell, our friend Milton Campbell from INPE, Brazil. I mean, he's congratulating you for a nice presentation and has a question. From the orbital passive microwave sensors, are you processing which product? Example, given uh, flooded versus no flooded areas as a binary map or any other, I mean, product? Oh. So Milton, I'm more than happy to speak more offline, but we are using uh, the uh, satellite constellations uh, by NOAA, the SSMI. Uh, we are using the classical frequency of 37 gigahertz, and uh, uh, we are taking the raw data and creating our own uh, our own product from the raw data because that's what I've been doing for the past 25 years of my career. Uh, concerning the yes, we can create two kind of maps. The first map. Uh, is a binary map, flawed and not flawed, actually three. Uh, we can create a second map, which tells you the uh, estimated fraction of flawed within each pixel. So this is a more a fuzzy non-binary, uh, but gives you a distribution of uh, how, uh, how much coverage within each pixel of the flawed there is. And also we can create, of course, historical maps that tells you the probability of the pixel to be inundated for every month or every day of the year based on the, on the historical data. Yeah, so thank you, Marco. Somehow linked to this question, and then I'll go back to other questions from Greg and from Asma. I mean, are you planning to integrate SAR data into your tool, for instance, for the new constellations such as ICI? I mean, this is Tony Septon from, uh, from ESA. Yeah, Tony, thank you for, uh, uh, I use a lot Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-5, so I, I gave a, a shout out uh, to ESA and I was, you know, uh, I, I think without ESA, a lot of the work that is occurring would not be possible because of the satellites and because also the business model of ESA is in terms of uh, uh, opening uh, the data sets and also pushing the commercial side that has promoted the development of a lot of good tools. Uh, ISI, yes, uh, ISI is uh, basically a radar uh, the small set constellation. Uh, I think it's still commercial. Of course, there's a lot of application, 
uh, we explored with uh, um, people from, uh, from a company here in New York uh, named cloud to street uh, they're, they're exploring the use of ISI, um, but, and definitely there is a huge potential for this. And merging the SAR data with passing microwave as well optical data, of course, it's uh, it's crucial. We did that. I, in this case, I wanted mostly to point out the benefit of passing microwave to provide a daily uh, global coverage. Where even in the case of uh, um, of uh, a Sentinel and others, you still have three or four days. So what does it happen if you don't have the satellite during that event, you can still fill the gap. And uh, having a high density data set is extremely helpful, like in the case of the passing microwave, because you can build historical information and uh, you can look more at a uh, uh, probability of events and so on. Yeah. But brilliant. Uh, thanks for, for, to ISA uh, for, uh, uh, ISA basically sponsor also my PhD in Italy. So thank you again. So now we have a, a question from Asma Ibrahim. She, Asma is from Nasdra, Nigeria, the National uh, Nigerian Space Research Agency. And uh, her question is, what are the factors that determine the influx of affluent residents into the areas that are gentrified? Is it that these areas are less prone to flooding and sea level rise? Yes, but hi Asma, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, the, the, the idea is that's what I'm trying to understand with the tool. Of course, what are the drivers? What I learned so far is that uh, you have these areas that are surrounded by uh, areas where the poverty level is low. Uh, in Florida, there is a big problem of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, saturation of a real estate market. They have no more space, so they want to build more houses. With, they have more people inside. So um, a lot of the, uh, the places that you saw uh, that I was mentioning to you, they are mobile homes. Uh, there are people who live uh, uh, with an uh, annual salary, we're talking about annual, about between $8,000 and $12,000 a year. They, rent, they pay the rent of $350 to $400 a year in 2014, and now they pay $600. Uh, so the, bur the burden rent is very high. And yes, the main focus, the theory is that these are climate shelter. They are less prone to flooding, but also to hurricanes, winds, because they, and Florida is very flat. We're talking about like 10 feet, five meters higher than the past. But if you're behind the wall, you're protected. And so uh, the idea is the speculators are looking at these areas that are historically occupied by vulnerable people because uh, are far away from the coast, but now they are becoming interest of the speculators because they are sheltered by these events. And they are still relatively close to, uh, to, the, um, to the ocean. And speaking about government, a lot of these areas are actually, uh, these things are happening in what are called opportunity zones, which are areas uh, defined by the government as a potential areas of economic development where they give a lot of uh, benefits. But of course, you need to have the money to invest there. And so the outcome is instead of helping the local population with these opportunity zone tools, this is actually a tool through which speculators can identify areas and can go in and perform this kind of actions, which is, you know, uh, something that's very dear to me because I, I can see, I can help to try to make a difference and help these people who deserve it. Okay, so, I mean, we have, a, I will combine two questions, I mean, of, from Gregory Jenkins. Oh, by the way, Gregory Jenkins is from Ezeda, Penn State University. Does your tool include race? Historically, race has pushed people of color around the U.S. We see this in Philadelphia, New York City. Can you tangle that? And he gives an example. For example, the Ninth Ward in New Orleans was a swamp that black people were forced to live in. Yes, Greg, this is a good point. Um, as I mentioned, the, the place uh, that I found, and, and this is consistent with other places, they have a, a minority level percentage population of about 80%. Um, the place that I looked and I found this specific area, we're talking about 90% African Americans. Um, and we're talking about uh, uh, surrounding areas, basically white uh, people, 5%. So the two areas I was showing you, <clears throat> the one where you have a strong eviction increase and the other top one where you have a, a, a no eviction uh, increase or very small evictions, the area below it, it is basically 90, 85%, 90% African-Americans, very low income uh, per capita income, $10,000 a year. And this, the attached area above 
We have basically a 20% African Americans, very small Hispanic. We have a mostly white people, and the per capita income on average is about sixty thousand dollars. So, uh, in, in this specific region, we're talking about African Americans. In other areas, in Jacksonville as well, uh, and in Tampa, I found that uh, Hispanic also is uh, uh, is is another uh, ethnicity, but definitely the most uh, uh, the, the ethnicity that is most hit is African Americans for sure. And I do consider that uh, information in the analysis. Uh, again, apologies, I couldn't go through all the things, but uh, Greg, I'm more than happy to discuss this offline. Yes. Interested. Yeah. So, I mean, we still have some time for one last question. First, Tiago Garcia is congratulating you, congratulating you from. Uh, for your great talk. And then you have Natalia, uh, Natalia Ospina Alvarez. Uh, Natalia is currently on the Earth Center and uh, she's working on the Azores. She was just arrived and she's working on aquaculture. And her question is, uh, my question is about the case you presented of the hurricane Flores flooding. Uh, how do you think real estate market could change if these two would be applied? Well, uh, that's a big question. I, um, I don't know. And the thing is, think about this, uh, uh, Natalia. In Florida, there is no state taxes. And a lot of the taxes come from, uh, for the state come from real estate. Uh, so that becomes a huge issue to fight between the uh, business as usual income for a state and how population perceive their lifestyle there and uh, versus changes in this. This is also why there's so much speculation in Florida because the more you build, the more state, the more taxes they pay. And of course the state is happy. Um, but definitely it, it is, uh, uh, this kind of tools could be provided. I wouldn't say to real estate because I don't know if real estate people really care about these things, but better to people, you know, imagine when you go there and you say, well, you're building, a, uh, you're buying a house here or they're gonna build a house there what are the two the best tools to, uh, to assess the potential exposure or damage? And now this is what I was mentioning also when I say the spread of the tools is we, the tools that are available now, they are only from commercial entities who got access, who had the financial power to buy these commercial data sets that have to do with the real estate and who have the resources to put all these packages together and of course, government and local authorities, they don't have this, um, this, this power from a financial perspective. So uh, one, uh, my concern in this regard now is that if we start using these tools, then we're gonna start using tools that we don't know what they're telling us. You know, as uh, we know that the man with one word clock always know what time is it. So you can be sure of everything, but the man with two watches never know what time is it. Once you start having two models that tell you two different things, how do you know which one is right? So one thing we're doing now, we're starting with Apostle Carol Hulquist here in Lamont, who has been helping a lot with this work. Uh, we're starting to do an assessment of different techniques and data sets to see how much do they agree or they disagree. Uh, and uh, as I always say, I need to build a career before destroying it. So I hope that this paper, when it comes out, is not gonna upset too many people, but definitely this is uh, generally what I hope uh, these tools can be used for. And uh, uh, this is why I'm trying to go into publicly data available, assessing the commercial uh, of these data sets uh, and, uh, and, and sharing things with everybody. Yeah, so I will take two more questions now and then uh, you have a final question for you from, from me, curiosity of my, my curiosity. So this is from Francisco Barros. He's congratulating you for the talk, really nice. And then, I mean, basically uh, he wants to know if uh, it's time for politics to review values and decide if they really want to change from business as usual. How have you been talking and negotiating with politics and managers regarding in this necessary change? So uh, I, as I, I spend half of my time, uh, or what's left of it, looking at Greenland melting and the other half looking at these things. And so I, uh, I'm work on this side, uh, Francisco, I'm working a lot with uh, people who have been doing this job longer than I am. Climate gentrification has been introduced by Jesse Keenan uh, at Harvard and Tulane University. Uh, and uh, he has been the spare head of this work. Uh, and he is, uh, um, you know, I'm his partner in crime on this. So we're working on this paper. He has a lot of connections with uh, counties and policies. And uh, again, one thing that uh, 
that, that drove the development, or at least looking at this tool that became uh, the development of this tool for me is that in September of 2020, I was uh, listening to a radio, the, you know, an episode in which they were describing the potential gentrification of Little Haiti. And I told myself, oh, I, I know I can do, I know I have the tools to help these people to develop the scientific um, data and applications that they need to uh, to show their cases, uh, uh, you know, local uh, advocacy lawyers and, and, and community lawyer uh, advocacy people. So that's what I did. And I dove in, I started basically doing this for the past five months. And I wanted to do this because I want this tool to become exactly what you mentioned in Francisco, uh, something that people can go there. It's not just one paper by me. Uh, I'm no one, but it could be that they start pre preparing documents or reports on different cases and they can go to the local authorities they look this is actually really happening and this can be elevated then a national uh, a national level um so especially with the new administration in other states maybe there's been more uh room for uh, uh for these things and uh another thing that i've been doing i've been now uh for this year i'll be a resident at the climate at the columbia business school where i hope to uh strengthen the connections of course with policies Okay, thank you. And, and Marlene Larus asks, in terms of risk tolerance, it seems that there is a high level of risk tolerance by the government. Uh, areas of North Carolina are insured by government? So, uh, flood, uh, when it comes to flood in, uh, in America, it, uh, most of the uh, claims and insurance, they go through FEMA. Uh, it's a national flood insurance plan. Uh, it's managed by the government. Um, in, in a very short um, answer, <coughs> in a very short answer, uh, if you are a buyer and your mortgage is backed up by the government, you have to have flood insurance through the government uh, for specific areas designated by FEMA. Uh, now, the problem is that the way the National Flood Insurance Plan is built, uh, because it's a government entity and it wasn't built to sustain this kind of fiscal financial pressure, uh, they cannot increase too much, of course, the, the, the premiums. And so they are uh, they were at about 30 billion in loss for paying the premiums because they can't ask more money to people because it's not like a regular insurance. I expect, uh, I give a 3% increase next year because I expect to be more damaged. Or I can give a discount, incentives, these kind of things. So they keep charging, they, they can make increases and changes, but they keep charging roughly the same, but they pay more and more. So this is creating a problem in the government, of course. Uh, at the same time, people who are now forced to have insurance, uh, they have to pay these premiums or the, or to the government. Uh, and, and so this creates more fiscal pressure because we were talking about from 600 to low level to even $4,000 a year. Uh, and if, of course, your income is, let's say, even $25,000, that is already a huge part of your annual income. And so this is somehow creating a lot of stress in the insurance market for floods. This is also why private insurance companies, they are still waiting to see what happens. And uh, uh, so there's no government official payment. Are the people are paying through the government and through FEMA maps and the National Flood Insurance Plan. Oh, thank you. So, Marco, we are most we are ten minutes after the hour, but I have a, a final question for you, uh, if I may ask. And if you okay. uh, please, please bear with me, the audience. I mean, uh, Marco and I, together with Eisman, and several people, I mean, from several different organizations in in, in Nigeria, have been discussing. I mean, the impact of floods in Nigeria. So, what, how can we how can we put all this? tools together to not only to forecast and to help plan and manage for the future, but also to, to have societal impact now. I'm talking about, for example, the early warning systems for floods that could affect, I mean, dozens of millions of people in Nigeria, only in Nigeria, for example. How can you combine all that to not only to have something for the future and to also to understand the better the past, but also to act now to help people in, 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 in areas like Nigeria, Benue and Niger River? Right. There are, there are three points that they come very quickly. And of course, it's not exhaustive. I don't want to say this everything, but three things and I'll be quick. The first one is uh, uh, deployment of reliable sensors in strategic places. You know, now we only have cages along the coast. 
why not putting uh, sensors where we know flood occurs, but it's, uh, it's not uh, along the coast, but we can have the sensor. They cost nothing now. They can send data through satellite links in real time and, and tell us where the flood might be starting. Maybe it could be, it could be in people's places, it could be in government buildings. So we can build a little network that is not very expensive, but it still can help to uh, monitor the, the, the potential initial stage of floods where it matters for the population, not only along the coast. The second, of course, is uh, the, ex uh, I'm sorry, this is a real New York uh, background. Um, <laughs> Uh, the second is uh, uh, the use of these satellites that I was showing, for example, passive microwave, to give you daily information. And uh, suppose that there is a flood coming to Nigeria, but the rivers that are, that are filling up are in other countries, as I was mentioning. You still want to know what's happening in the other country. And of course, based on your relationship with that or the infrastructure of the other country, you might not be able to access that data. And this can be done uh, now by putting together infrastructure. And, three, and third, uh, I think the important thing is the knowledge transfer. We need to transfer the information, not simply just, oh, there's a service online, there's a GIS tool, you can click there, this is great, and this is what I wanna do. But from a government point of view, if I were, you know, it, my wish would be to train my own people, my own future scientists uh, through a collaboration, not only to use these tools, but also to, uh, uh, to become familiar so that A, they can train others in the country and create a culture in, in the country where it can help local communities. And B, at the same time, they can help developing more resources from a financial infrastructure and technical point of view without, of course, the need of people external like me or others and have their own core uh, and grow in, in this direction. So these are the three points uh, on a very short um, uh, um, fuse. Okay, so thank you so much, Mark. It was a fantastic session. I mean, I hope you have enjoyed. Next week, we have David Obura from Cordio East Africa. He'll talk about, I mean, conservation of corals in Kenya and Tanzania. So again, Marco, if you have a final word for yes. the audience. I wanted to apologize again for the technical issues, but I'm glad and thank you for hanging out and staying here. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I hope uh, I encourage everyone at any level, if you're in a company, industry, academia, you're a student, please reach out to me because I want to learn from you as much you might want to learn from me. So um, I hope this can also help people and it can help to you know, shed some light on a, on a huge issue, uh, which of course uh, is uh, you know, floods and economic impacts. Um, so thank you very much for having me, Jose, and uh, thank you for, uh, to everybody for uh, uh, for being patient with the presentation. Okay, so thank you. See you next week. Bye.